I have a question for you. Do you embrace linear encoders or do you avoid them whenever possible? Or are you wondering what a linear encoder even is? After all this sizing and selecting of mechanics and even designing your own mechanics, you might be considering putting a feedback device on there and whether you should or not. I'm Corey Foster at Valen Corporation. Let's see what we can learn. If you like what you are learning, follow my hashtag motion control show and check out this website. You might want to start with what is feedback. Uh, feedback is if you have a command going to your motor or mechanics and you put a device on there to give you information back to your electronics. That's a feedback device. It's feeding information back. Now if you take that off, this is called open loop where you're giving a command and then you're just expecting your motor to do what you've told it to do. It's a lot like throwing a, bo a bowling ball down an alley. You throw the ball, you put it into motion, and then you get a strike or maybe a gutter ball, somewhere in between. If you had a feedback device, you could you know, nudge it over on the way down the lane. This is much more like a car, where you're driving a car, you are the feedback device because you're watching the road and you're making constant adjust adjustments. Um, your, um, your cruise control is a feedback device that is adjusting the cruising speed. The bowling ball is open loop. You driving a car, that's closed loop. And that's what the feedback device providing information back is. <clears throat> if we look at this, uh, restructure this a little bit, the command comes through and it goes through some electronics. Uh, in this case, A is for amplifier, and the amplifier powers the motor. We put a feedback device onto the back of the motor, and that provides the information back to a summing junction. The command comes in, and then it gets subtracted. Uh, the information coming back gets subtracted from it. That's why there's a plus and a minus there. And then the error between the two, the difference between the two, is what goes on to the amplifier. If we had a positive there where the information is coming back, then they would just add together, and that would be a feedback loop. Just picture, uh, picture a screeching microphone where it just gets out of control. So that's why we subtract that feedback. So that's really the basics of feedback. There's a lot more. There's a lot of different kinds, but that's just the basics for the moment. <clears throat> that helps us to ask the question, why would you want feedback? Okay, so let's say you put a motor on a ball screw and you have bearings here carrying the load you can put a linear scale along the side and this reed head runs along the scale and this reed head would be attached to this uh, carriage here and that would be providing feedback maybe you're worried about whether or not your load is actually getting to the location you're telling it to uh, what happens if the coupler slips or the coupler breaks or maybe you, you're concerned about whether your ball screw actuator is actually uh, precise enough and you want to get a little more precision out of it. Uh, maybe you want to compensate for the mechanical backlash. If you look at this chart here, distance is here on the Y, time is on the X. If you are expecting this black line here, you're expecting to get to this distance, but because of the mechanical backlash, it it lags a little bit and so it never quite gets there. If you had that feedback you could go a little bit further and you could pick up this slot. You could tell if your coupler was broken. You could take a rolled ball screw and make it a little bit more precise instead of needing a ground ball screw. You'd have to take a look at that design and whether the cost is worth it for you. You could take a ground ball screw make it more precise. There's different types of linear feedback, and each one of them has the pros and cons. <clears throat> there's the optical, there's magnetic, there's inductive. Some are a little bit more expensive because they're a little more precise. Some are a little bit less expensive because they're not as precise. Some are more robust, better for machine uh, cutting tool applications, for example, for vibration or temperature. But before you assume too much about linear encoders and think they're going to solve all of your problems, two things you might want to consider. One is it makes your electronics more complicated. So leave that for the electronics guys, right? Let them deal with it. 
but it does make your electronics more complicated, more sophisticated, and therefore more expensive. So think about that. The other thing to think about is that linear encoders, as do uh, rotary er uh, encoders, they do have errors in them. So just because you have a one micron linear encoder doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get one micron out of it. It's going to be close, but we're going to talk about that the next episode. I hope that gives you some idea of what you're looking at for feedback and whether or not you want it. I'm Corey Foster at Valen Corporation. I hope this helps.